Welcome to the Medical Definitions Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Vincenti. Today, we have a guest whose name needs no introduction in the medical world. He's a professor at Cambridge University and a leading expert in allergic conditions, Professor Otto Muller. Professor, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me, Natalie. I'm glad to be here. So, let's start with the simplest yet most important question. Professor, how would you explain what an allergy is to someone who's never encountered it before? Imagine you're talking to a patient who has no medical background at all. All right, if I were to give a brief medical definition, I'd say an allergy is essentially an overreaction of our body's defense system. Imagine your immune system as an army tasked with protecting you from invaders like viruses and bacteria. Normally, it does an excellent job, but sometimes the army starts seeing threats where there aren't any. And these can be completely harmless things, pollen, pet dander, or even peanuts. The immune system perceives them as dangerous and starts attacking, leading to those unpleasant symptoms we experience. So if I understand correctly, the body reacts to something completely ordinary as if it were dangerous. Exactly. And this often results in the very symptoms many of us are familiar with. Sneezing, itching, rashes, or even more severe reactions like swelling or anaphylaxis. Wow, so our immune system can be a bit overprotective, huh? That really explains why even something as simple as a flower can cause such a strong reaction in someone. Absolutely right, Natalie. It really highlights how complex our bodies are. Allergies aren't something out of the ordinary. They're just an incorrect response to something very ordinary. Professor Muller, you know what's always puzzled me? Why do some people have allergies while others don't? Is it just random or is there something more behind it? Like genetics? Inheritance? That's a fascinating question, Natalie. The thing is, the tendency to develop allergies can indeed be inherited. If your parents had allergies, the chances that you'll have them too are significantly higher. But that's not the only factor. Genetics definitely play a big role, but we can't forget about the environment a person lives in. So if, for example, my mom sneezed at every flower, does that mean I'm also likely to be an allergy sufferer? Yes, that's quite possible. However, Natalie, it's important to understand that a genetic predisposition is not a sentence. You might inherit certain genes, but the allergy itself might not manifest if the environmental conditions you live in don't trigger it. This is the so-called genes plus environment principle. External factors like air pollution, diet, and stress levels also play a role in whether or not an allergy will develop and how severe it might be. So wait a minute. If I understand correctly, even if I have allergic genes, that doesn't necessarily mean I'll suffer from allergies. It all depends on how I live and what environment I'm in. Exactly. It's about what triggers you encounter and how your body responds to them. Allergies are the result of the interaction between your genes and your environment. That's so interesting. It turns out that to some extent, we can control whether we'll have allergies or not just by paying attention to our lifestyle and surroundings. <music> Professor Muller, here's another question that's on the minds of many of our listeners. We live in a world where it seems like everyone has an allergy to something. Pollen, animals, food. Tell me, have allergic diseases changed over the past few decades? And if they have, what do you think could be driving these changes? Natalie, that's a very timely topic. We've observed a significant increase in the number of people suffering from allergies over the past few decades. What was once considered rare has become much more common today. There are many reasons for this, and they're quite complex. One of the main factors is that our environment has changed. We're living in cleaner, more sterile conditions than ever before, which, paradoxically, might actually be contributing to the rise in allergies. Wait a minute. How does that work? We're living cleaner, but that's causing more allergies? Why is that? Yes, it does sound paradoxical, but it's connected to what's known as the hygiene hypothesis. This theory suggests that our immune system, particularly during childhood, isn't exposed to as many bacteria and viruses as it used to be. As a result, the immune system starts looking for enemies and reacting to harmless substances like pollen or food. 
So does that mean our obsession with cleanliness and sterility might actually be working against us? Unfortunately, yes. Of course, this is just one of the possible causes. There are other factors as well, such as changes in diet, increased use of chemicals in everyday life, air pollution, and even stress. All of these can contribute to the rise in allergic diseases. We're living in a more complex environment, and sometimes our bodies can't keep up with these changes. That's simply astonishing. It turns out that our modern life, with all its comfort and cleanliness, can have such unexpected consequences. I want to remind our listeners that we're currently discussing allergies on the Medical Definitions podcast. Stay with us. There's much more to come. Dear listeners, welcome back to another episode of our podcast, Medical Definitions. Today, we have a very special guest, Professor Otto Miller from Cambridge University, a renowned expert in allergies and allergic conditions. We're diving into one of the most pressing topics, allergies. Professor, thank you again for making time for us. Thank you, Natalie. I'm happy to be here. Professor, one of the most common questions our listeners ask is, how can allergies manifest on the skin? What are the symptoms and how can we recognize them? That's a great question, Natalie. Allergies can manifest on the skin in various ways, often depending on how the body reacts to certain allergens. One of the most well-known manifestations is hives, those itchy red welts that can appear within minutes of contact with an allergen. Oh, those annoying spots that itch and you just can't help but scratch? Exactly, and the more you scratch, the worse it gets. But that's not all. Some people may develop atopic dermatitis, a chronic skin condition characterized by dryness, redness, and flaking. It can be so severe at times that long-term treatment might be necessary. That sounds terrible. What about eczema? I often hear it's also related to allergies. Yes, Natalie, eczema is another example. In fact, eczema is a general term used to describe inflammatory skin conditions, and it can indeed be triggered by allergies. Symptoms include redness, itching, and even cracking of the skin. Children are particularly prone to it, but adults can experience it as well. So if you suddenly develop a rash or your skin starts itching, it could be an allergy? Absolutely. It's crucial not to ignore such symptoms. It's best to consult a specialist who can determine the cause and prescribe the appropriate treatment. Thank you, Professor. And to our listeners, we'll be back in just a few seconds to continue this fascinating conversation. Don't go away. Dear listeners, we're continuing our conversation with Professor Otto Miller, and now I'd like to touch on a topic that many find concerning. Professor, you've already explained how allergies can manifest on the skin, but what should someone do once they've already developed a reaction? What treatment options are available for managing skin allergies? That's an excellent question, Natalie, and I'm sure many of our listeners are eager to hear the answer. Let's start with the simplest approach, avoiding the allergen. If you know what triggers your reaction, the most reliable way to prevent it is to avoid that substance altogether. That makes sense, but it's not always that easy, is it? Sometimes you don't even know what's causing your skin to react. You're absolutely right, Natalie. In such cases, medication can be very helpful. Antihistamines are commonly used to relieve symptoms of skin allergies. They work by blocking the effects of histamine, the substance responsible for causing inflammation and itching. There are also corticosteroid creams and ointments that can help reduce inflammation and soothe the skin. Corticosteroids sound serious, don't they? Are there any risks involved? Yes, Natalie. Corticosteroids can be highly effective, but they should not be used for extended periods due to potential side effects, such as thinning of the skin. That's why these treatments should be prescribed by a doctor and used exactly as directed. What if antihistamines and corticosteroids don't work? That can happen, right? Absolutely. There are cases where more intensive treatment is needed. In such situations, immunotherapy might be necessary. This is a long-term treatment where the patient is gradually exposed to small doses of the allergen to help the body get used to it and reduce its overreaction. Additionally, some people may benefit from immunomodulatory drugs that help regulate the immune system. 
So, there are many options, but it all depends on the specific situation and the patient's condition. Exactly. It's crucial to consult a specialist to determine the right course of treatment. Self-medicating can actually make the problem worse. Thank you, Professor, for these important clarifications. It really helps to understand the issue better. And we're not done yet. Stay tuned for more on our show. We're continuing our conversation with Professor Otto Miller, and the next topic I'd like to discuss is food allergies. Professor, I'm sure you'll agree that food allergies are a significant issue in today's world. It seems like more and more people are suffering from them. Could you tell us which foods most commonly trigger allergic reactions and more importantly, why? Natalie, you're absolutely right. Food allergies have indeed become more widespread and this is a serious concern. When it comes to foods that most frequently cause allergic reactions, the first ones that come to mind are nuts, particularly peanuts. Allergies to milk, eggs, fish and shellfish, wheat and soy are also very common. Nuts and milk, yes, I've heard of those, but why are they the culprits? What makes them so dangerous? That's a great question, Natalie. The issue lies in the proteins these foods contain. Our immune system can mistakenly identify these proteins as a threat. Take peanuts, for example. They contain specific proteins that in some people can activate the immune system, which then starts to, to fight them as if they were harmful invaders. This triggers a cascade of reactions, including the release of histamine, which leads to allergy symptoms. So our bodies are confusing these proteins with something harmful. It's strange that such an important system can make mistakes like that. Exactly. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the immune system. It sometimes overreacts and triggers an allergic response. Interestingly, some research suggests that food allergies can develop due to genetic predisposition or even as a result of how a person was introduced to certain foods in early childhood. So it's not just random. It's the result of a complex interaction between our genes and the environment we live in. Yes, it's a combination of factors and they can vary from person to person. That's why it's so important to understand what you're allergic to and how to avoid it. Professor, do you have any thoughts on why food allergies are becoming more common? Is it related to our diet or the environment? That's a very intriguing question, Natalie, and honestly, scientists are still searching for a definitive answer. However, it's likely that changes in our diet the increased consumption of processed foods and a reduction in exposure to natural allergens during childhood could play a role. We're hearing more about the hygiene hypothesis, which suggests that our excessive focus on cleanliness might weaken the immune system, making it more prone to allergies. That's fascinating. So it sounds like we need to find a balance between cleanliness and immunity. Exactly, Natalie. We're talking about a balance that's crucial for a healthy immune system. Today, as we strive to minimize contact with germs and allergens, our immune system may simply forget how to deal with them, which can lead to issues like food allergies. So our pursuit of perfect cleanliness might actually be backfiring on us? Precisely. On one hand, it protects us from infections, but on the other, it deprives the immune system of opportunities to learn and adapt. As a result, it may start reacting even to harmless substances, such as the proteins found in food. Interesting. What about children? I've heard that food allergies are more common among them. Is that true? Yes, Natalie. Food allergies are indeed more common in children. In early childhood, the immune system is still developing and learning to distinguish between self and non-self. If during this period, a child is exposed to an allergen that their body mistakenly identifies as a threat, an allergic reaction can develop. This often happens with milk, eggs, or nuts. It sounds like we need to be especially cautious about what children eat. But what should parents do if their child already has a food allergy? How can they protect them? First and foremost, it's crucial to identify and confirm the allergen through testing so you know exactly what to avoid. It's also important to consult an allergist to develop a dietary and treatment plan. In some cases, the doctor might recommend introducing allergens in small doses under controlled conditions. This is called oral immunotherapy. But this should only be done under medical supervision. 
So, parents need to be extremely vigilant and not hesitate to seek help. Absolutely, Natalie. Food allergies are a serious condition, but with the right approach, they can be managed, and the child can lead a full life. Thank you, Professor Miller, for such an informative and important discussion. I think many of our listeners learned a lot today. We're continuing our discussion with Professor Otto Miller, and now we're touching on a topic that could affect any of us, drug allergies. Professor, just how serious is this problem? And most importantly, how should patients and doctors approach treatment when drug allergies are involved? Natalie, drug allergies are indeed one of the most complex and I would say insidious forms of allergy. They can emerge unexpectedly and manifest in various ways ranging from a mild rash to severe, life-threatening reactions like anaphylactic shock. It's frightening to think about how dangerous that could be. What should be done if such a situation arises? How can doctors prevent complications? In these cases, close cooperation between doctors and patients is crucial. The first step is to accurately identify which drug caused the allergic reaction. This may require specific tests or even hospitalization for observation. It's also essential to gather a thorough medical history to understand which medications the patient has already taken and which ones might have triggered the allergy. So it's like a detective work to find the culprit. Exactly, but that's not all. Once the culprit is identified, it must be completely removed from the list of potential medications. It's important for patients to always carry information about their allergy, such as a medical bracelet or card, so that in an emergency, doctors know which drugs to avoid. And what if that drug needs to be replaced? How do doctors find an alternative? This, of course, requires great caution. Doctors must select a medication that does not contain the allergens. Sometimes they have to resort to drugs from different classes or even experimental treatments. However, any changes in treatment should always be done under the supervision of a specialist. In some cases, desensitization may be necessary where the allergen is introduced in minimal doses to gradually acclimate the body. But this should only be done in a controlled hospital environment. So the key is attention to detail and clear communication between doctor and patient. Absolutely. Drug allergies are not something to be ignored or self-treated. It's vital that patients are well-informed about their condition and doctors are vigilant and cautious when prescribing any medications. Thank you, Professor. You've explained such complex matters in a way that's so clear and understandable. I'm sure our listeners now better grasp how important it is to take drug allergies seriously. We'll be back in just a few seconds. Stay tuned. So friends, we're continuing our fascinating conversation about allergies with Professor Otto Miller. Now I'd like to ask a question that I'm sure is on many people's minds. Professor, what complications can arise in patients with severe allergic reactions? And most importantly, how can these complications be managed? Natalie, that's an incredibly important question because severe allergic reactions can lead to serious consequences, even life-threatening ones. The most dangerous complication is anaphylactic shock. This is a condition where the immune system overreacts to an allergen, causing a sudden drop in blood pressure, swelling of the airways, difficulty breathing, and if untreated, it can be fatal. That sounds truly terrifying. Professor, what should be done if anaphylactic shock does occur? How can someone be helped? In such a situation, every minute counts. The most critical step is the rapid administration of epinephrine, which helps to alleviate the acute symptoms and stabilize the patient's condition. People at risk of anaphylaxis are usually advised by their doctors to always carry an epinephrine auto-injector, this can be life-saving in an emergency. After administering epinephrine, it's essential to call emergency services immediately, as symptoms can return even after temporary relief. But Professor, how can such dangerous situations be prevented in the first place? Are there any preventive measures? Preventive measures are indeed crucial. Patients who are aware of their allergies need to avoid contact with allergens. This might involve changes in diet, avoiding certain medications, and carefully checking the ingredients in products and medicines. However, 
Despite all precautions, there's always a chance of accidental exposure, so it's vital to be prepared to respond quickly. So preparation and awareness are our main allies in combating severe allergic reactions. Absolutely right, Natalie. Knowing your allergens, carrying an epinephrine auto-injector, and being mindful of your surroundings all significantly reduce the risk of severe outcomes. And of course, regular consultations with an allergist will help keep the situation under control. Thank you, Professor, for your invaluable advice. I hope our listeners now feel more confident about managing severe allergic reactions. Well, dear listeners, today Professor Otto Miller and I have thoroughly discussed one of the most pressing topics in medicine, allergies. We covered how they can manifest on the skin, how to manage food and drug allergies, and how to prevent and respond to severe allergic reactions. I hope this information has been helpful and will aid you in better understanding your health. Natalie, thank you for inviting me and for providing the opportunity to talk about such an important subject. Dear listeners, please be attentive to your health. Don't hesitate to consult your doctors and always monitor how your body responds. Knowledge is power, especially when it comes to your health. Thank you, Professor, for your valuable advice and for being with us today. And to our listeners, I'd like to say, take care of yourselves and remember that your health is in your hands. See you in the next episode of the Medical Definitions Podcast. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you to everyone who tuned in. I wish you all good health and the best of luck. Until next time, friends. Thank you.